Hello, everyone. Our channel selects viewpoints and analytical articles from think tanks and well-known figures within the Chinese Internet and presents them to Western readers so that everyone can understand how China thinks. If you find this helpful, please subscribe, hit the like button, and share our channel. Thank you. It should be emphasized that the content we present reflects only the original author's views. Our aim is merely to enhance readers' understanding of perspectives from the Chinese intellectual and policymaking circles. Before we enter today's commentary, let us share a few reflections from our channel. How China Thinks Since the late 1970s, through the reforms that introduced market mechanisms and later through accession to the World Trade Organization, China has absorbed advanced industrial capacity from around the world. Combined with a vast workforce of engineers, this has produced what may now be the world's most comprehensive and self-sustaining industrial and technological ecosystem. This achievement is not to be underestimated. Humanity may be standing at the threshold of an era in which the technological high ground is defined not by the West, but by China. That is one possible direction. Another possibility is that the world will evolve into two distinct technological universes, one centered around the United States and another led by China. We already see early signs. Dual operating systems such as Windows and Harmony OS, parallel semiconductor ecosystems, and competing standards across telecommunications and defense industries. The outcome will depend not only on China's determination, but also on whether Western alliances can maintain cohesion. Yet, as history shows, liberal capitalism often struggles to act collectively. As Karl Marx once observed, a capitalist would gladly sell the rope used to hang him. This fundamental tension makes unity difficult. For now, China seems to hold the initiative. Once it secures its domestic market and completes its internal technology chain, challenges such as chips, lithography machines, or semiconductors are likely to be overcome. Within the next decade, we may find out whether humanity will indeed operate under two technological civilizations. Unlike the Soviet era, when competition was confined mainly to military domains, China's capabilities now span every layer of modern life, from consumer goods to critical infrastructure. If China ultimately defines the global technological order, then perhaps, in a sense, every person on Earth will be living a Chinese life because human civilization has always been shaped by technology. Fire defined our diet. The wheel defined mobility. Bronze and iron defined war and power. And today, data, algorithms, and semiconductors define how we live, think, and connect. Western institutions such as Nature or the Nobel Committee still dominate symbolic recognition, but these are remnants of an earlier era of discourse much like how Greek remained the language of culture long after Rome conquered Greece. In a similar way, English may remain globally influential even as Chinese power rises. If this transformation truly unfolds, are we ready for a world in which technology, and therefore everyday life, is defined by China? With that question in mind, let us now turn to a recent commentary from a Chinese technology observer offering a first-hand perspective on how China's industrial ecosystem continues to accelerate its breakthroughs. This commentary was published on November 4, 2025, at 1011. In recent years, China has made remarkable progress in technology, from ultra-high voltage transmission and grid-scale energy storage to mobile communications, defense technologies, and high-speed rail, China has become a global leader. In manufacturing, there are products that only Chinese companies can produce. Many others simply can't. When the United States tried to slow our progress, China managed to make breakthroughs in a surprisingly short time. It's now clear that the so-called chip restrictions cannot stop China's momentum. Under pressure, China built a complete semiconductor supply chain with impressive speed. The balance of power may soon begin to shift. At first, many people couldn't understand why. When the U.S. first tightened its controls, most analysts doubted that China could reach this point. But some experts, like technology commentator Mr. Wang, stayed confident. His confidence wasn't based on emotion, but on direct industry knowledge and years of conversations with people working across China's tech landscape. 
He realized early on that China's progress in one area often sparks breakthroughs in many others, one success leading to the next. Take the example of lithography machines. Some said China would never be able to build its own. A few even claimed that companies like Huawei didn't understand how lithography worked. Others argued that since a lithography system includes tens of thousands of parts, it must depend on global collaboration. In reality, that view misunderstands modern manufacturing. Consider one of the most important components, the optical lens. Many believed only Zeiss in Germany could produce it, and that Chinese firms would never manage. Zeiss's strength comes from its long tradition in lens making, so people assumed that experience was essential. But as technology analyst Mr. Wang later discovered, a Chinese company had already done it, not as a lab prototype, but as a mass production supplier. Interestingly, this company had never made lenses before and didn't need old school craftsmanship. What matters most for lithography lenses isn't polishing, it's purity, removing impurities from silicon during processing. In that field, Chinese firms have long led the world. So when they turned to optical lenses, it felt natural. The company prefers to stay low-key, so Mr. Wang decided not to reveal its name. Now take another example, electromagnetic catapults on aircraft carriers. The U.S. has faced serious difficulties. While Chinese naval engineer Professor Ma, a leading expert in this field, has made steady progress. Why has he been so successful? Because he's working in China, a place with deep experience in superconductivity, ultra-high voltage systems, large-scale energy storage, and advanced heat dissipation technologies. Here, the supporting tools and materials are ready to use. For every idea Professor Ma puts forward, there are hundreds of supporting capabilities across industries to make it real. What looks extraordinary in the U.S. is almost routine in China, because the same skills have already matured in other sectors. They can be reused reliably and efficiently. A similar story appears with arresting cables for carrier-based aircraft. While the U.S. struggled to find the right solution, Chinese firms had already developed products that far exceeded those performance standards. The U.S. could have used them directly, right off the shelf. Today, China's technology ecosystem has reached a stage where one success can unlock many others. Whenever China decides to build something new, the capabilities it needs already exist somewhere in its industrial base. They can be drawn together quickly. Think about those examples again. Ultra-pure lenses, powerful heat dissipation systems, grid-scale energy storage, and ultra-high voltage power transmission. Together, they've enabled the development of laser weapons that outperform those of the United States by a wide margin. The principles are similar, but without heat sinks, UHV conductors, massive energy storage, and high-quality lenses, you can't build a strong laser weapon. And we're not talking about a few lenses. We're talking about thousands. Made at scale. Once you've produced tens of thousands of lenses for laser systems, making lithography lenses becomes far simpler. This is what one breakthrough unlocking many really means. China's powerful industrial foundation makes it possible to move fast and stay ahead. What once sounded impossible is now happening. And as experts like Mr. Wang point out, this confidence comes from experience from seeing up close how Chinese innovation keeps expanding from one victory to the next. In recent days, a wave of online comments added color and emotion to the discussion. A commenter from Sichuan said the idea that a lithography machine must rely on multi-nation cooperation is misguided. If China's provinces were treated as small countries like those in Europe, he said it would already count as multinational collaboration but smoother, since there are no internal barriers. A commenter from Shandong noted that every time he reads Mr. Xiang's essays, he feels deeply inspired and confident about China's direction. From Hebei, a small manufacturer proudly shared that his company is developing multi-terrain outdoor shoes based on new domestic materials, showing how industrial innovation connects across fields. And finally, a reader from Zhe Jiang summed up the spirit in one line. Technical progress is all about connections. Master one and you master many. That concludes today's narration.
Through the voices of China's industrial thinkers, we've explored how policy, technology, and strategy converge in the country's push to rise through software and intelligence. For clarity and flow, some parts of the original conversation have been summarized or slightly adjusted. Certain technical or context-heavy sections have also been refined to make them easier for international audiences to follow. If you would like to read the full transcript or discuss the ideas in more depth, you are welcome to reach out to us directly. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to How China Thinks. Thank you for listening and see you next time.